Today we is April the 1st, 2011, and I am Barbara Diaz, and I am here interviewing Kevin Dayhoff for the Oral History Project. So, we're going to start with a little bit of background information about uh, Mr. Dayhoff and growing up in Carroll County. Yeah, we're in the basement of uh, the Hoover Library up at McDaniel College, which of course uh, one, of the th one of the topics of this discussion is the development of arts and culture in Carroll County and how it's progressed through history. And of course, McDaniel College has always played a, a very important role in that dynamic in the community. It's also cold outside. I can't wait for spring. Um, but um, Ms. Diaz has uh, uh, given me a whole series of questions that uh, hopefully we'll be able to cover and um, hopefully enlighten folks a little bit about um, culture and and uh, art and, and history in Carroll County. I'm Kevin Dayhoff. I'm a Westminster native. I live on Uniontown Road here in Westminster with my wife Caroline Babylon and appropriately um, my wife has two degrees from McDaniel College and uh, many members of her family for uh, quite a number of generations have gone to McDaniel College or what was then uh, Western Maryland College before it changed its name. I'm a self-employed business person, uh, an artist, uh, a freelance journalist, and uh, a columnist, and I've been doing that for, for quite a number of years. I've been exhibiting art since 1981. I currently write for three publications. I write for the Carroll Eagle. That's a local paper in Carroll County that's owned by the Baltimore Sun. I write for the Tentacle. It's an online opinion publication. It's based in Frederick. And I write for Investigative Voice. It's an investigative online publication. Deals an awful lot with cops, courts, and crime in Baltimore City. But artistically, I write short stories. Uh, my favorite art media is uh, drawing, mixed media assemblage, and collage. And in recent years, I've been doing an awful lot of stuff with the computer, um, creating and, and um, uh, collaging in the computer. My favorite writing subject is art and culture and history, especially economic history. Your first how, question? How long have you lived in Carroll County? I was born and raised in Westminster in Carroll County. Um, I believe that my family first moved to Howard County or the southwestern area of Carroll County or the southeastern area of Frederick County uh, around 1696 and that would be primarily the Wright family. Um, my descendants are the, uh, my ancestors are the Wrights, the Gillises, the Warfield, the Grimes, the Haynes, and the Farmer family. I know the Haynes family came to, came to this area in the, in the late 1600s, but my direct lineage is the Wright family. And uh, when the Wrights first came to Carroll County, they were Quakers. Interestingly enough, they came from Ireland, but they were British. They had been awarded property in Ireland for service to the king, and it was in 1696 that uh, they first uh, uh, came to America. Now, for a, a bit of Carroll County history, I think uh, it's believed that the first homestead was a log cabin trading post near uh, present-day Linwood and that was built by John Steelman around 1715. In 1744, there were approximately 65 families living in Carroll County. Um, settling Carroll County was very difficult at first because at first there were conflicts with uh, the Native Americans and they weren't really resolved until the Treaty of Lancaster or what some other historians refer to as the Treaty of Six Nations that was signed on July 4th, 1744. And then there was also the dynamic of the French and Indian War. A lot of folks are not aware, but the French and Indian, Indian War in this part of Maryland, the Carroll County, uh, Frederick County, and area west was, was pretty horrific um, in this area. And it may lead, um, it, it may give uh, folks a certain insight as to why there's such a strong military tradition in Carroll County. Uh, because uh, first settling the conflicts with the, uh, with, uh, the uh, Six Nations um, and um, settling the conflicts with the French was pretty important before it was safe 
to settle in this area. Um, of course, the Treaty of Paris was signed in 1763, and that was uh, that signaled the end of the French and Indian War. The French and Indian War, of course, lasted from 1754 to 1763. And that was one of the last pieces of the puzzle which enabled folks to come to Carroll County freely and easily, um, relatively free from violence. The, the last piece, of course, was the American Revolution, 1775 to 1783. However, it was not until the Treaty of Six Nations with the Haudenosaunee Nation uh, and the dispute over the Mason-Dixon line was settled in 1767 that the settlers were able to come here in greater, in, in greater numbers. What a lot of folks do not know about Carroll County history is that before 1744, the predominant government in Carroll County was the um, Haudenosaunee Shawnee Nation, the Six Nations. And the Haudani Shawnee played a key role in the evolution of American democracy, and paradoxically, it's one of the main reasons why we speak English today. But the very first settlers were the Algonquins, who arrived here around 800 BC. Um, they were they divided into a number of distinct nations and formed a multinational government under a constitution that dates to approximately August the 31st. 1142. The um, the Algonquins, or they called, they referred to themselves as a, the uh, Hadani Shawnee, meaning people of the Longhouse, and their government was one of the first true participatory democracies in history. And interestingly enough, since um, uh, next week is Diversity Week up here at um, at uh, McDaniel <laughs> College. And then also, interestingly enough, the week after is Trivia Week. Uh, so appropriately, we should uh, call to folks' attention that, uh, um, that the, the Six Nations government fully incorporated full political and leadership rights to women. Now, the French term for the Six Nations Confederacy was Iroquois. And that's one of the very few times I say that word because that term is considered to be a racial slur among many uh, Native Americans. But the six nations consisted of nation states and they were from all, they, they, they included the Mohawks, the Oneidas, uh, the Senecas, the Tuscaloras, and the six nations extended from Labrador to um, uh, South Carolina. And um, there are some folks which aren't really keen on the theory that much of our system of government uh, came from the um, uh, Six Nations government, but um, but um, it, it, there's a consistent thought that, that um, perhaps uh, Jefferson and Franklin um, based our system of government on that. I think. Um, I think my family, um, one of the first mentions of my family in Carroll County history, the Wright family, comes around 1764. There was a Joel Wright who uh, is noted to have been a well-known Quaker schoolmaster, uh, according to, uh, I believe it's Carol Lee's Legacy of the Land, uh, a book on the history of Carroll County. Another mention uh, to my ancestors in what we now know as Carroll County uh, came around... Um, November the 22nd, 1826, when Joseph and Isaac Wright were, one of, uh, were, were two of the original signatories to the Anti-Slavery Society that formed at the Friends Pipe Creek Meeting House just outside of uh, Union Bridge. And what part of the county did you grow up specifically? I grew up in Westminster. I grew up at 306 East Green Street in an apartment <laughs> behind uh, Samio's Grocery Store. And uh, I now refer to it as a Joni Mitchell song. They paved paradise and turned it into a parking lot. The store and the apartment were torn down a number of years ago, and it's now a parking lot for uh, Maggie's Restaurant. Interestingly enough, that portion of Green Street between Center Street and Washington Road was one of the one of the cities, the city of Westminster's first annexations in 1788. And that area of town was one of the five key boroughs 
that was incorporated into the city of Westminster when the city first incorporated on February 5th, 1819. A lot of folks are not aware that the city of Westminster is actually five different hamlets put together. Um, a lot of folks are also not aware that when the property, when White's Level, the first property that was purchased that later became the city of Westminster in 1733, at that time in Maryland it was part of Prince George's County. Frederick County didn't form until 1748 and of course we were part of Frederick County and Baltimore County until 1837. But in, in 1764, when William Winchester laid out, first laid out the city of Westminster, um, there was the old town, which when I was growing up was referred to as the dead end. <laughs> and then there was Irish town at the other end of town uh, in the Pennsylvania Avenue area. Um, and actually, th there was an, a, a big economic rivalry between old Westminster and the Pennsylvania Avenue area, Irish Town. Irish Town was formed by uh, the, the the railroad workers, the Irish railroad workers, who uh, came and helped put the railroad through uh, Westminster and Carroll County in the late 1850s and the early 1860s. But uh, there was New London. Uh, another hamlet uh, was called Longston Tavern. Um, there was uh, New London that I mentioned, uh, Bedford was another part of town, and they put all these towns together in, in, in 1819. Later in um, 1961, my family moved out to the Tree Street development, which is just outside of town uh, on the Baltimore side. Later in, in um, 1983, I purchased a farm in Patapsico, which I've always been fascinated was one of the, the settlements of the Haudenosaunee Nation. Um, the Haudenosaunee Nation are responsible for the three main routes and many of the settlements in Carroll County. Route 30, Route 27, and what we now know uh, as, uh, uh, as um, Route 140. Route 140 and 97. They were all traditional uh, trading routes of the Haudenosaunee Nation. Hmm. Um, from, from 1974 to uh, 1999, I made a living as a landscape designer, and I think it's interesting. I grew, up as a, I grew up as an artist in Carroll County, and there's no better place to grow up an artist than in Carroll County. Um, it, was very, it was very well accepted. I was constantly encouraged by my teachers, uh, my family was very supportive, my friends, my circle of friends were, were very supportive. I grew up reading and I grew up drawing constantly. Um, but after, after I went to North Carolina uh, to school for a couple of years and served in the Marine Corps Reserve, um, I figured out that if you spent a lot of time doing a collage or doing a drawing, you ended up with a storage problem. But if you, uh, if you drew a landscape design, you could actually sell it and earn a living. That was something that the community could understand. And all throughout my childhood, I had this little red clipboard, and actually I looked for it, I wanted to bring it <laughs> to the interview. But I, had to, I still have it. I had this little red clipboard, and I would go all, go, go, go all through Westminster, and I would line up landscaping jobs, which for the most part was mowing, but it was also trimming hedges and things like that. And uh, so in, in 1974, after a couple of years of working in the Carpenters Union and some things like that, I went into business for myself. I raised nursery stock. I drew landscape designs. I was able to put my writing ability to, to work. I would write narratives and, and, and plans for properties, and I did property management um, um, consulting in that time period. I, I, I moved back to Westminster from, from Patapsico in 1997. Do you feel that uh, Carroll County was a culturally diverse county when you were growing up, and how does that compare to what you feel the dynamics of the county are today? 
Well, I grew up in, in, in Carroll County in the 1950s and the 1960s. I grew up in Westminster in the 19, uh, and, and that in that time period, I was totally unaware of cultural diversity. I had no concept of it whatsoever. Um, and I guess part of that is because uh, Carroll County is a very, very hard-working community. Um, usually, folks in Carroll County are preoccupied with performance. Can you do the work? And it, it, it just doesn't matter what color or what necessarily what language you speak. But, but also, I, I, I guess I wasn't aware of it at the time, but I grew up in what we would now know as an enlightened household. Um, except for a merchant here or there, my ancestors were mostly farmers or carpenters or factory or construction workers. Um, <clears throat> I mean, if you're, if you're talking about cultural diversity, I've always thought city people were a bit odd. But if you're referring to African Americans, my mom and my dad both had black friends who visited the house. I had black friends and diversity simply was not an issue, it wasn't a concept. Um, my dad worked with African Americans at Black and & Decker, and mom grew up with black tenant farmers who ate regularly at her house. So um, it just wasn't the thing. I spent a great deal of time with Spanish-speaking folks over at Westminster Nurseries growing up, and other than always wanting to learn Spanish, I never thought anything of it, and I still don't. I guess another dynamic is that <clears throat> I was raised in a religious household, and I'm still religious, and um, I figure that we're all God's creatures, and my conclusion is, is that God was very artistic, and when he created us, he got creative, so if, in, if diversity is important to God, then it's uh, important to me. I also served with a lot of diversity in the Marine Corps Reserve um, from 1971 to 1973, <clears throat> and uh, it simply... Uh, it simply wasn't an issue. I'll admit that sometimes I feel a little awkwardly about New York Yankee and Indianapolis Colts fans, but uh, whatever. I, I was never really aware of prejudice until I left Westminster to go to college in North Carolina. And in part as a result of working, advocating for civil rights in the South in the early 1970s, and because I really liked the local leadership of the Carroll County NAACP, I became a life member of the NAACP. Um, the, the history of slavery in Carroll County, it, it's a fascinating history. Um, I grew the area that I grew up in, the Washington Road Green Street area, was a pocket of free uh, blacks that lived in that area of town. There's very little there's very little indication uh, of that at this point in time. But historically, and say for example, if we can go back to 1840, if you go back to 1840 in Carroll County, the population of Carroll County was 17,421. And about three years earlier than that, of that 17,421, there were 1,044 slaves in, um, in Carroll County. Um, I hope I'm not repeating myself, but northern Carroll County, mostly the German settlers, they had no interest in having slaves. Southern Carroll County, the, the Germans who settled in northern Carroll County, came down from Pennsylvania. The English who settled the southern part of Carroll County, is, that's where the slave ownership was. Now paradoxically, if you can figure this out in history, um, the um, northern Carroll County that did not own slaves, for the most part, supported the South during the American Civil War. And the English who owned slaves and Southern Carroll County supported the North. And it's something that historians have always been, it, it sounds totally paradoxical, it sounds totally illogical, but that, in a nutshell, simplistically, um, uh, was, uh, was, was what it was all about. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here, I did some research for, the, for, your, for your questions here. Um, oh, I've always been fascinated with uh, the fact that um, Northern Carroll County spoke German, and Southern Carroll County spoke English. Did we touch upon that earlier? Yeah, and um, 
uh, as far as diversity is concerned, uh, historically getting the getting the English speaking folks and the and the German speaking folks to get along was a challenge. Uh, as a matter of fact, in 1833, in October of 1833, in what we now know as Carroll County, there was a vote taken as to whether or not we should form Carroll County. It took 50 years to form Carroll County, um, and Carroll County was finally formed in 1837. But in 1833, there was a vote. Uh, the ballots were printed in both German and English. Um, Ms. Warner, Nancy Warner, wrote a book on the history of Carroll County. She wrote it back in uh, 1976. And, um, oh, what did she write? She wrote, almost two-thirds of the slaves lived in the southern half of the county. They worked primarily on tobacco plantations. However, uh, there was a presentation by um, um, uh, a previous mayor in the city of Westminster, Mayor Brooks, who said in a, in a, in a, in a, a presentation, the English owned large tracts of land and numerous slaves, but when the Civil War began, they readily gave up their slaves and joined with Abraham Lincoln to save the Union. Um, now, the folks in the western part of the county, uh, which was settled to, for a great extent uh, by Quakers, um, my family, they tended to be very much opposed to slavery. But it's appropriate and fitting that we're having this conversation at McDaniel College because when, when we, we look at the, the, the turmoil to end segregation in the 1950s and the early 1960s, it was Western Maryland College, now McDaniel College, that really led the way uh, to a great extent. And there were a number of reasons why it is that it led the way. Certainly there were the religious reasons, certainly there were the dynamics of, of a great group of people came together. Uh, some of the names included Ira Zepp, Del Palmer, uh, Charles Crane, Bill David, Sam Case, and Ray Mowbray. But we also owe um, a lot of the, the efforts to, um, to uh, um, to end segregation in Westminster and Carroll County to the Baltimore Colts. Because the Baltimore Colts came to Western Maryland College to practice during the summer, and, and a number of the athletes were African American, and uh, uh, many folks uh, in the uh, credit the community with wanting to make the uh, African American athletes uh, feel welcome as another impetus in, in the desegregation. But I wrote a piece back in 2001, Western Maryland College, A Legacy of Pushing Social Envelopes. And it's fascinating to go back through the history. Um, uh, in one history book, which predated Dr. Jim Leitner's excellent history of McDaniel College, there was um, a history called The Formative Years. And on page 50 of the formative years, there's a, a photograph of a Japanese student in the 1880s. And it's believed that this was the first foreign-born student at Western Maryland College. Dr. Jim Leitner, in an interview when I wrote that piece a number of years ago, 10 years ago at this point in time, shared with me that it was just after World War II that Western Maryland College again pushed the social envelope by welcoming a Jewish student named Alec Resnick, um, who I believe he graduated around 1947. I've had a couple of opportunities to talk with uh, Mr. Resnick, a fascinating man. According to some information with Dr. Zepp uh, a number of years ago, I worked with Dr. Zepp for quite a number of years uh, on, on various projects, and he, he lent me a hand when I was looking at uh, the history of, uh, of Western Maryland College, now McDaniel College, of pushing the social envelope. He said that he believed that the first African American to be admitted to Western Maryland College was 1961, but at the time, um, he didn't, he, he didn't attend for a, a series of reasons. Now, when I started public schools in Carroll County in 1959, we were in that period of time, that awkward period between 1954 
when uh, there was the Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas case, the Supreme Court case, uh, that separate was not equal till the Public Accommodations Act in the state of Maryland in 1964. Um, I started school in 1959 and it was in that period that institutions and restaurants and things in the Westminster area were, were desegregated. Another thing that a lot of people are not aware as to one of the reasons why Maryland, a southern state, and the Carroll County area there was an emphasis on, on um, addressing racial segregation was that the UN had started right at the end of World War II and black diplomats would travel from the UN in New York to Washington DC for various reasons and there are a series of awkward occurrences which occurred in that time period which, which, needed, uh, which needed to be addressed. I'm sitting here looking over, I had done some research as to the first, um, the first African American, yeah, uh, Dr. Zepp had written to me on February 3rd, 2001, the first African Americans to graduate were Charles Victor McTeer and Charles Smothers, and they graduated in 1961. And that might give folks a little bit of a, a perspective. One of the last um, instances of uh, segregation in, in restaurants occurred, and it was documented um, in a Baltimore Sun article on January 3rd and January 10th, 1964. Uh, the mayor of Sykesville owned a drugstore, and he was accused uh, by uh, Gene S. Evans and Bailey Conaway of being refused service on November 14th, 1963. But even back then, the county commissioners addressed, addressed the situation quickly. Um, and on January 9th, according to the newspaper count, 1964, um, the, uh, the folks Evans and Conaway ate in the restaurant. Recently, a number of folks have brought up what I believe to be an unsupported urban legend of Carroll County being a hotbed of Ku Klux Klan activity. Um, I grew up in Westminster and I've studied Westminster and Carroll County's history rather intently and I have found very little evidence to support that. If I'm not mistaken, there was some sort of a Klan rally in Westminster in the 1950s there was a couple there were a couple of clan rallies in Gamber 1950s 1960s 1960s maybe perhaps um, but a lot of um, a lot of the mythology comes from the fact that the, there was a hotbed of there was an instance in August of 1998 in which a KKK rally was held in Carroll County, Virginia, not Maryland, Virginia. And inter it's a fascinating case because at, actually at the time, um, the attorney representing the Ku Klux Klan folks who had run afoul of the law in some way, shape, form, or manner was an African American. So uh, I love those little twists. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, the last instance of a rally, yeah, that sort of has you thinking, yeah. doesn't it? And, and the <laughs> interviews with the African-American attorney who represented the Klan members, is, is fast, it's a fascinating read. One of the last instances, and I always like to refer to it as the Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan's Invisible Empire, took place on September 12, 1987, near Manchester. Emphasis needs to be placed on invisible as anecdotal accounts indicate that it was poorly attended and hardly anyone from Carroll County was there. And what was the reaction of the community? The community was outraged. And uh, actually the New York Times wrote about it on October 5th, 1987. New York Times article tells an interesting tale. A high school newspaper voluntarily turned over photographic negatives of a Ku Klux Klan rally in the Carroll, to the Carroll County State's Attorney's Office 
after a local daily newspaper refused to do it. Um, there was, um, uh, what was it, state's attorney at the time, Tom Hickman, issued an administrative summons for the pictures, but uh, the, the local paper refused to comply. The editor, Gene Bracken, said many photographers were at the public event and that the prosecutor could have easily hired someone and refused to turn over the pictures, but it was the Westminster High School Owl newspaper who turned over the pictures. Um, Dr. King has now been, Dr. Martin Luther King, who happens to be one of my personal heroes, um, when you look over the challenges and the difficulties that this gentleman overcame, it's just quite an inspiring story, but over 40 years left, or over 40 years later, we have an awful lot of work to do. There's still much more work to do, but um, I think by coming together and working in a positive way, I think we can do that. <laughs> At what point did you become involved with the arts and cultural development of Carroll County, and what prompted you to do so? Well, you know, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating question because I can never remember a time in which I wasn't involved in arts and culture in Carroll County. Um, I sang in the church choir at the Westminster United Methodist Church. I played trumpet for the, for the William F. Myers and Sons Band. I mean, it was just what we did growing up in Carroll County, going to school and church plays, social activities. It was a constant childhood dynamic. And... Um, I received nothing but great encouragement from my teachers, from my friends, from my family. I read everything I could get my hands on, and as a matter of fact, I love to tell the story that in spite of the fact that I lived at the other end of town, I would bicycle up to the Hoover Library. I was fascinated with the Hoover Library at McDaniel College. I have vague memories of Old Main being which was torn down in the very late 1950s, and then the Hoover Library was built around 1962 or so. But I still have my Western Maryland College library card that I was <laughs> issued in, in the 60s. That's cool. But summers were always my favorite time of the year, and to this day I still don't understand snow and cold. Uh, growing up in Carroll County in the 1950s and 60s, summer meant school was uh, uh, the school was out, we had family cookouts, we went to the beach, we had vacations, we played neighborhood baseball games, we played in the band, we participated in church and school or social club schools, plays and productions. Um, you know, I, um, I, um, I read everything, you know, and I'm, I, I was, I was fascinated. I, one of my favorite stories um, was um, when I went to Westminster Junior High School, which is now, is it West Middle School? Um, I read everything that I could could lay my hands on, and, and uh, I, I don't recall many of the titles of the books except for the two that got me in trouble. One of them was Valley of the Dolls, and the other was Portnoy's Complaint. I began reading both books in school, but I had to finish them in the summer. And what happened was, if you will recall, Valley of the Dolls was, was uh, written by uh, Jacqueline Suzanne. She published it in 1966, and I got in hot water reading it at Westminster Junior High School. The, the book was a huge bestseller, and I, but I, I didn't, I really didn't understand why it was so controversial for, for, for me uh, to read it. The book was about friendship and trials and tribulations of three women uh, just after World War II. And my trauma over Point Noise complaint occurred at Westminster High School, and that book was written by Philip Roth, and it was released in 1969. And the style of writing was new to me, and um, I guess it has it, affected me to this day. It was a stream of consciousness narrative of um, uh, the main character, uh, Alexander Portnoy, talking with his psychoanalyst. But I got in trouble for reading that book in class. 
I had it hidden behind my textbook and I burst out laughing when I read the part where the narrator was recounting his embarrassment from a school incident in which he was worried that the word spatula was Yiddish and he could not think of the English word for it. So I had to go to the principal's office for that also. Interestingly enough, I grew up in a religious household and in both instances when this activity was reported upon to my mom, I mean, the teachers, everybody was expecting my mom to be pretty outraged, but she wasn't. My mom, who's just one of the coolest people on the planet, my mom says, well, this just gives us an opportunity to talk with them about these things. And I thought that that was, uh, that was a great, I thought that was a cool response. And I mean, that's the kind of mom that I had. Um, uh, and and I, I think that was so important for my, mom was always interested in cultural and, and artistic activities. There were always books around the house. There was always an emphasis on that. In your opinion, what impact does art and culture have on a community? And um, I guess we've talked a little bit about the history of the arts in Carroll County. I mean, there's always been an emphasis on, on art, art and culture, singing opportunities, plays, social functions, dinners. Um, you know, from, from Carroll County's earliest beginnings, faith in the church, family, art and cultural events, and especially music, that I, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't, I, I wish I had now. The history of the local bands in Carroll County is fascinating. So many bands, community bands that had, were formed in the 1800s uh, and, and uh, uh, were so important. I played in the William McMyers and Sons band. I played the trumpet. But the music and the singing groups, you know, along with diversity, um, we kind of um, didn't totally touch upon, I mean, diversity brings a collage materials to a community, mm -hmm. and, and that's what makes a community really strong, in, in that diversity. I always like to say that I would much more rather emphasize building an inclusive community than diversity, and I always like to say the difference is, is that diversity is counting heads and building an inclusive community is making heads count. I mean, we need all hands on deck with all the challenges that we have these days um, in our country, in, in the world, and, and, and in Carroll County. And, and we need as many different ideas, as many folks as possible. And that's what glues together and makes for a strong community. But um, over the years, so many of the friendships, the romances, the successful families owe their beginnings to singing together in a church choir or playing in a band like the Westminster Municipal Band or attending a church or a school function. Um, over the years, a lot of the venues have changed, but because Carroll County, <coughs> because, Carroll, because of where Carroll County was situated among these, these main routes west, um, in the very, very early part of the settlement of Carroll County, 10 miles was how far you could travel walking behind an ox-driven cart. So that's why we have so many communities that are 10 miles apart, almost 10 miles exactly mm -hmm. apart throughout Carroll County. And in Westminster in particular, because there was a confluence of so many of the main routes, that's why we had such an emphasis on hotels um, in, in, in the Carroll County area. Uh, hopefully I can come across it here as to the number. Oh yeah, here it is. <coughs> Lillian Shipley in September, uh, she was a, a curator at the Historical Society for Carroll County. Um, in September 1971, she wrote, around the turn of the century, Westminster had seven churches, seven hotels, and 18 saloons. Um, the, other, the other dynamic <clears throat> the other dynamic that was going on in Carroll County was the work was so hard, and and it, it's always been a very hard working community. But I, I've written in a piece that I wrote um, some time ago, as Westminster emerged from the 1800s, folklore had it 
that between the mud, the dust, the smoke, the flies, horse and mule droppings, roaming cattle, hogs and dogs, the good old days weren't so good, throw in bar rooms and all that accompany them and it paints quite a picture. Now, to get away from the, the work on the farm and to get away from a lot of the rugged and, and hard conditions, um, folks would would have their, their, their picnics and they would, uh, or, or the Carroll Theater was, was a big deal when it first came about in, in 1937. But when you look at gluing together, a, a lot of the challenges in Carroll County these days are we have a lot of folks who've moved into the community and many of the folks moved into the community maybe for pub reasons of public safety or, or lower tax rates or a, a nicer mm -hmm. home or whatever and of course that, that's accompanied by these horrendous commutes that some of these folks are. But what's going to bring all of us together are these shared experiences. That's the experiences of family members being involved in the arts or cultural events, attending things at the Carroll Arts Center, attending I, growing up attending cult, art and cultural events at McDaniel College, then in those days Western Maryland College, was extraordinarily important to me. I was constantly up here for school productions or plays or art exhibits. Um, and that's, that's what makes, that's what makes, that's what glues folks together. That's, that's what the, the, the various disparate, the, 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 the city folks that have moved in, uh, the folks that have been here. It's the arts that build a sense of community, identity, and pride. It's the arts programs that give us our sense of community and a quality of life by bringing together for a shared experience. What a lot of folks are not also not aware is the economic clout. I write economic history. I look at all history from an economic from an economist's point of view, the arts and culture generates huge revenues for a community. And it's also a key economic development driver. When a business is looking for a place to locate, one of the things that the business a business is going to be interested, of course, or zoning issues or taxation issues or the availability of a large workforce or a trained workforce. But they're also going to look at the artistic opportunities, the cultural opportunities, and that's what that's what brings that, that that's 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 what Carroll County has to offer. Um, but so often you know, for events at the college or events at uh, Carroll Community College or the Carroll Arts Center or church, church functions or school functions, folks will get together for dinner beforehand mm -hmm. or they'll grab ice cream at Hoffman's or, or, or Balkers after the program. Their kids get together. And this is, this is the incubator. This is what puts together various different folks all type, all from all walks of life. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to, to see the construction workers who have become friends with the bank executives who have become friends with uh, various folks throughout the community. Growing up, that was normal. I mean, you know, we all that's where we met. We met at church or we met at social we, social events that were affiliated in some way, shape or form with, with arts and culture. Arts and culture and diversity and building a, a strong, inclusive community, they all come together. They all, they, it's a collage. They all come together to make for um, a better product. Uh, a region such as Carroll County or, or the Westminster community is not necessarily transformed by the power and the quality and the value of art, but it gives a community a greater sense of vibrancy, optimism, a sense of self-worth, and that's what makes for a community, arts and culture. Mm -hmm. I agree. Thanks well, for your time. Well,